Hello and welcome to Quality Policing. I am Peter Moskos. A bit of a warning first, this is a long episode. Uh, it goes for just over two hours. Um, feel free to break it up if you'd like. I was going to break it up for you and then I decided uh, you can do that on your own. But it's, it's, an, it's a long episode and that is because uh, it wasn't actually made for the podcast. I was speaking to Arthur Storch an ins- former inspector of the NYPD. He was a precinct commander during the crime drop in the 90s, and I wanted to talk to him about the crime drop in the 90s for the book that I'm working on, which is about the crime drop in New York in the 90s. Um, and it's an oral history told from the perspective mostly of police officers who were on the job. Uh, but there was a lot of interesting stuff, and um, we thought it would make a good podcast episode. About halfway through... Um, we are joined by Louis Anamone, who is, was the f- uh, chief of department in the NYPD and Branton's right-hand man, and he uh, he joins our discussion um, at about one hour, 15 minutes, I believe. I'm not exactly certain. Um, but I, I the conversation was originally three hours. Uh, this episode is edited down to two hours, but um, I thought I'd leave it there, even though it's a bit long. I hope you enjoy listening to it. I think there's a lot of good stuff in here. In the early days of Bratton, when we first started Comstat and we were bringing down crime, at that point, we had full-blown community policing in NYPD. And I was a precinct commander at the, the first year of Comstat. And I had 15 beat officers and they were the like some of the most important cops I had in my command. So we were trying to uh, introduce the bike patrol program. And it had been an experiment in New York City funded by the Police Foundation. And the experiment was a success, but, but the way it works is they, the foundation will fund these one-time expenses, but they're not gonna continue to fund the program once it's adopted by the police department. Um, I in- invited someone from the Police Foundation and some cops who did bike patrol in another precinct my, to come make a presentation to my community council. And they fell in love with the idea. So they formed a bike patrol committee and they went to each of those micro communities to talk about it, to try and do fundraising everywhere. So anyway, I go to that Lindenwood community. They had a, a civic association just for them. And I went to I went, visit them all. So I visited them. We talk about all sorts of stuff. And at one point, the head of the association says to me, listen, the bike patrol sounds like a great idea. But uh, John, and I'll give you the full name of this cop because they loved him so much, John Jeromina. John doesn't ride a bike. So why should we donate to the bike fund? <laughs> you know? And I said, well, you know, uh, you'll have bike patrol even if John doesn't you know, ride a bike. And I said, wait, 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 wait. You're not taking John away because we're not giving anything if John's leaving. <laughs> I said, no, no, John will be there and you also have bike patrol, All right? So anyway, now I walk away and they raised a thousand dollars in that community to contribute to the bike fund. My community raised something like, we received the 23 to $26,000 to buy bicycles and bicycle uniforms for the police officers, right, for their cops. So, in fact, I, ask, I, I, I mean, I, I spoke, I forget who one of the interviews I did was with the guy who started the bike uh, squad in, in my precinct in the 114 here. And he, uh, yeah, he said Models donated clothes and, and, and bike shops were very supportive. Um, we're not talking big bucks here. Um, this is chump change for the NYPD. What? <clears throat> yeah, well, you multiply it by 76 precincts, you know, and it was 75 back then, 76 now, all right? Um, and you, again, we bought twenty-three to twenty-six thousand dollars for just our prison. So multiply that by seventy-five or seventy-six, plus the PSAs. Uh, there, you know, there are about three a bar- per borough. Uh, it can be it's money. It's All money. right, we're talking about two million, I guess. I got my yeah. calculator here. I didn't do that one in my head, <laughs> but they weren't going to do it. So anyway, the the, uh, the uh, they. They, they raised the money. Now, let's just stay on John Jeromino, just him for a second, all right? So one night, I'm at another civic association meeting with the lieutenant, and I, the meeting's over, and I get in the car, and I'm going to ride back to, drive back to my precinct, and a job comes over the radio, a domestic violence call, all right? No, no sector cars pick up the call, 
So I'm in the car with my lieutenant. And I say 106 CO Central will, will respond to that domestic violence call. I don't want anyone getting hurt. Now, normally when cops are hiding, you know, they're going to come out of the hole really quickly. Right. As soon as the CO says he's going, <laughs> oh, well, Sector Adams available. We just finished that job. But no one actually did that. So right. that may, makes you realize that they actually were gainfully employed at that moment. So John, my lieutenant and I drive, not with Jeremino, but John White, we drive to Lindenwood. I knock on the door, I say, oh, police, can you please open the door? And the woman who was just called for the help, for police help, said, John, we only open the door for John. <laughs> you know? so, so I said, I said, no, John works with me. I'm the precinct commander. You can trust me. You can open the door. So she did open the door. We handled that job. Okay. Last issue. I get promoted out of this precinct because of the crime reduction, no good relations with the community. I am now in, the, but I keep in touch with them. You know, I call every once in a while because it's good, good. And I find out that Lindenwood bought, paid ten thousand dollars, I think is what it cost, to buy John a three-wheel scooter because John doesn't ride anything with only two wheels, <laughs> and they wanted to make it easier for John to go to it to and from the community, and he wouldn't ride a two-wheel scooter. <laughs> so anyway. That's just John. And if you multiply that by 15 neighborhoods, that's how they felt about their beat officers. So to me, I had an ambassador of goodwill who really cared about that community. It wasn't, you know, service, who cared about, cared about him back, all right? And that's going on every day. You know, when I'm doing something else, these guys are still there every day interacting with those people. And that's what we lost within a year of Bratton leaving. Yeah, we still had Comstat, we still were being strategic in our crime reduction plans, but we had no community policing. By the time I left in 2002, right, they were putting like, because of, of 2001, they were like basically putting up barricades to not let the public in the precinct. You know, they, they, we were afraid of our own community. And, you know, how do you have any kind of uh, you no know, trust. Then, then, in the middle of that, though, were like about twelve to fourteen years of abuse of stop and frisk, because not really understanding how we got our crime reduction. And I, I'm I'm curious to see what I know. You talk to you, Louis Animal all the time, so you can see what he says about this. But um, but the the. When I had, they would literally give a precinct commander a report card, right? And on your report card were all your crime statistics and your arrest statistics and your summon statistics, things like that, right? Not on that report was stop and frisk reports, right? That was added later because stop and frisk up until then was a way to document why we Inter, why we in, inter, um, what's, what's the word I'm thinking of? Injected ourselves into someone's life and stopped their progress down the street to question them about something. All right, we we had to justify why we did it, and so it, it, there was no place on an arrest report for that because we don't arrest everybody we stop. So we they created a report say just justify why you did that, and that report of course is Rosario material, and that report you know, will be evidence at trial if we do make an arrest. Well, someone got the cover idea and, I, I, and I'm being sarcastic and I it could have been animal. And so don't, you know, don't put it on him this way. That that's a measure of how much we are investigating, being proactive. So I want to see more stop and frisk reports so that we're being out there engaging. The problem with that is, is should be obvious, is that not every cop is an investigator. What happens is at the end of the month, let's say the number was five, five in an entire month. That's not a tremendous amount of reports if you are that proactive, I like to like check things out type of police officer who's looking for signs of abnormality, you know, things like that, right? But not every cop is like that. You know, that, that's, just the, that's just the way of life. Not every cop is like that. And so um, now at the end of the month, oh Christ, they're gonna give me a hard time. I don't have my five stop and first reports and they'll go out on the street and they'll just stop five people because or they'll 
you know, they'll play another game to do it. You know, they'll try to stop and first report when they give a summons. So just find some stupid excuse to document report. And then that, what ends up happening is you get people stopped who shouldn't be stopped. You know, that's what happens. And so you make, instead of having those community um, beat officers who are out there humanizing the police department, getting to know the community, now you have these stranger police officers who are basically harassing you. And that went on for over a decade. And if you remember what it was like, when people would complain, they got, of course, 12 of those years was under Bloomberg, all right? And, and that, some things I like about Bloomberg, but this is the one thing I could never forgive him about, you know, was this policy that under his watch. Because his answer when anybody would complain is, well, I have complete faith in Ray Kelly. Uh, if you, have, you know, have any questions about that, talk to Ray Kelly. And this is the one thing I'll never forgive Ray Kelly over. Because his arrogant response was, what are you complaining about? Crime's going down. Well, I'm complaining about because my 12 year old has been stopped by the police five times. I used to ask my class at John Jay. Me too. All right. All right? How many of you have been stopped on your way to John Jay? Not today, but in, just in general, on your way to school or from school. And in every class I'd ever do that, I had five to seven people would raise their hand. You don't see that anymore because that judge, um, her name Shinlan. Was, yeah, Shinlan. she said, hey, this is racial profiling and you guys are open to lawsuits if this keeps going on. And 92% reduction in stop and frisk, but crime kept going down anyway. So, you know what, also Judge Shinlin, who is, um, you know, lots of cops at the time uh, complained about her. In her defense, she released a preliminary injunction where she <laughs> told Ray Kelly what she was going to do, basically saying, talk to me. Let's work this out. Clearly, this is. And Ray Kelly, great. as far as I know, basically said, fuck you. Right. And she said, no, 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 Ray Kelly. Fuck you. Exactly. Um, is that parallel to what happened in the due process revolution, right? The, uh, the, the Supreme um, Warren told police in general, hey, I see a lot of illegal search and seizures and illegal uh, t interrogations. Fix this before I have to do something about it. And they didn't fix it. And now there's the due process revolution. Everybody's screaming at the Warren court. They, they gave you a warning. You guys have to fix yourselves. And so I'm, I'm 100% for police reform. Uh, I don't like the slogan, deep on the police. And I don't like a lot of the other stuff that's coming out. But yeah, we did, we did over a decade of damage to our cells. And so you got a lot of people who are resentful of the police department. Yeah, the um, I mean, I, I would ask the same question in class, by the way. And, you know, as you know, we have a lot of smart students at John Jay College. And um, I mean, I remember one in particular who said, you know, I, he said, I, they're not rude to me. I don't because they were just doing it for quota reasons. You know, right. it became pro, pro forma. Um, but he said, what pisses me off is they're not stopping the drug dealers that I'm afraid of. Mm -hmm. And I said, why? <clears throat> why do you think that is? And he, he said, well, because I'm easier to stop. Like it wasn't the, the, the it was stats for stats purposes. Yeah, um, it was yeah. not stopping people that that were more likely that were engaged in criminal activity or likely to be. Right. Um, it's so now, the, the numbers I have, I'm looking at them now. So the first year I have recorded stops was 2002. Is that I maybe mean, that's when the um, what's known as the UF 250, the old form. Yeah. Um, the irony, of course, is I think and correct me if I'm wrong. NYPD had to start keeping accurate counts of stats because of a lawsuit. Right. Um, and boy, that was, a, <clears throat> that was a law of unintended consequences. And, you know, these numbers are questionable, especially at the beginning, um, because there were certainly a lot more stops that weren't recorded before. But now after. actually the, yeah, I mean, this thing started going bad way before 2002. All right. It started going bad. I'm telling you, you have to trust me on this literally a year or two after Bratton left. Bratton was there, he left by like 95 or six, right? Um, so that's when it went, started going bad. It, it, maybe it, it took a while before um, the, the groundswell of anger over it, you know, because again, we had, you're never gonna get a hundred percent, but we brought down crime 14%, something like that from 94 to 95. Right, that first year of Bratton. And I want to just throw in, when he became a commissioner of the NYPD, he said, I'm going to bring down crime. Yeah. Double digits. 
double digits. And everyone said that's crazy. Um, and I, I like to point that out partly because I think of where we're going today. It was considered crazy because at the time, going back probably to the 1968 Coroner Commission, it was assumed by many um, that cops didn't have an impact on crime. That was society's right. issue. Right. Um, cops kind of knew that was crazy. But on the other hand, look, if you're not going to blame us for crime, that's fine. <laughs> blame society. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll just try and arrest a few people. Um, so that for Bratton as a police chief to say, it's on me, I'm yeah. going to reduce crime. That was a monumental philosophical shift in policing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that, you know, everything comes from that. You know, everything else is a tool or a tactic or a strategy. But he said, it's on me. It's on the police department. Right. That was bold. Look, I was a grad student in John Jay in the 70s. Right. And that's what they taught us when I was going to grad school there. They're really socioeconomic issues. Police have very little to do with it. And that's just the fact of life. And cops don't like to admit it, but that's just the way it is. And um, no, it's it, cops can impact. But of course, cops can't do it alone. Right? They never could do it alone. So you have to you have to be you have to work with the community, and you have to also work with the entire with the bigger government community as well. And so the one thing that Giuliani look the one thing two things that Giuliani did right, and that's about probably the only two things in his life. Um, one is he hired Bratton, and two is he told all the other commissioners of New York City, my I ran on a, a you know crime fighting campaign, and you will all cooperate with this commissioner. And if I find out you're not cooperating with the commissioner, you know, you're in trouble, <laughs> you know, basically it. And so if we needed cooperation with, from the Department of Buildings, the Department of Real Property, the Parks Department, or the schools, they, were going, they would cooperate. They, would, they had to. And that allowed us to have real strategies, not just law enforcement actions, you know, tactics. But you need bigger strategies than that. Well, one and, of the things I heard was... Um, Somebody was telling me how pre-Bratton you had a sort of official community affairs officer and that person, you know, didn't have an office or a phone. Um, you know, the, the phone number on his card was just the precinct in general. And then he's supposed to, and someone complains about trash not being picked up and, you know, drug stash is being hidden in, in vacant buildings. And he's supposed to call up, you know, this rookie is supposed to call up the Department of Sanitation and get them to do something. And what it's happened... Not- yeah, it's not 100 percent accurate. Well, no. okay, correct me in a second. Uh, but he said, that, you know, <laughs> the Department of Sanitation shouldn't need to be told what to do. Like, do your damn job. So these other city agencies did pick up their their pick up the slack a bit. Well, we to, to get with the other agency thing. When I, again, I could speak of this as a precinct commander, right? I would every month I went to a district cabinet meeting, and at the district cabinet meeting was there was me from the police department, someone from the fire department, from someone from sanitation. And it could be some other city agency, depending if needed, right? But the main ones were there all the time. And so it was that she, the, my case was a woman. She would come to the meeting with, I guess, from the borough commander, a uh, borough president or something, um, complaints, right? Uh, things to be addressed. And we would sit there as people who could make the, make decisions for our agencies, well, how are we going to work together to resolve that complaint, right? That is what you, like I say, that's really critical that you can do those things. Um, but anyway, with the community affairs officer, the traditional community affairs officer was not a rookie, was some old timer. Actually, you know, when I said that word, I realized okay. that mistake, okay. but go on, go on. A lot of times they would have a detective shield because they would get rewarded for being the inside guy for the precinct commander all the time. And they did have, you know, a, like a black book, you know, of phone numbers to call because they had, they don't leave that job. That's it. They retire from that job. And so they get, they do know people to call and they, and they organize all the precinct wide community meetings, you know, uh, that, so, so I had two community affairs officers and one of them was a beat officer. That's remember I told you, I moved one up to a key from there and they, they were like my liaison to each of those civic associations in, in, in total. The beat officer was also would go to those meetings, you know, uh, but he, this is the guy, these are the ones that coordinated them all for me. And um, they were helpful, but, but that's what they did. They, they did the meetings. They did the, you know, phone calls to movers and shakers. 
but they didn't, they weren't grassroots. It was the beat officers who were grassroots. That's the, that, those are the cops that that woman who called for help knew. She's not gonna know the community affairs officer. She's not active in the civic association. She's gonna know the cop who's every day in her community. Look, when I taught community policing at John Jay, like I taught it, I was a designated community policing guy for a couple of years. Like Eli Silverman was the first one. And then when he took his sabbatical to write a book, I took over community policing. And I, so I used to bring guest speakers and uh, I, I would give them this one assignment. I'd say your assignment is to go meet your beat officer in your precinct. They, there's, everyone has one, right? I want you to identify, we'll learn what, the, what has been identified to the beat officer from your neighbors as the main problems in your community. What are the strategies the beat officer is using to address those problems? And how's it going? You know, what's the, you know, what's, assess it. So I had I, one of my inner city guy live up in Harlem came up to me and he said, hey, I don't, I, I, look, sounds like a great idea, but I don't, I've never seen a cop. I don't have a beat officer. I said, I promise you, you have a beat officer. And it's conceivable that you're in school every day and that's when he's out there or she's out there. But trust me, there is no block in the city of New York that doesn't have a cop assigned to that block. You know, it could be 10 square blocks, but have. So he went out, he did my assignment. He comes back to me, he says, I want you to bring this beat officer to class. This guy is the sharpest guy I've ever met. He is so in tune with what's going on in my community. I mean, I, he fell in love with him. Now, I had, an, and this is also true, I had a female student who literally fell in love with her beat officer and invited me to the wedding, all right? That's, that's what community policing was all about, that kind of connection. Now, this new incarnation of community policing, I don't have as much faith in it. Because what, what do they do now? They chop up a precinct into four pieces and each piece has, normally has its own sector car for answering radio runs, but also has a community policing car, all right? As they call it neighborhood coordination officers. And there are two of them per that car. And now instead of one per 15, one per one fifteenth of the command, they have two per one quarter of the command. You know what I mean? And so it, it takes away your ability to get really granular, you know, with your community, get down to the street level, as far as, as, far as uh, I'm concerned. I think well, one of the constant critiques of community policing as practiced is um, it segregates the concept into a specialized unit. Now, I know the NCO philosophy was intended to saturate the department with this idea. Um, it was, you know, the, its purpose was to not segregate these officers uh, as community of affairs people. Um, but it, in effect, it, it did. It didn't have to. No, it didn't have to. Because, first of all, they're out there supposed to deal with the local crime issues on their beat, right? So they're not just out there attending meetings, you know, having coffee and cake all the time. If there's a problem, they're supposed to be doing something about it. And so, to me, I, I treated them... Uh, look, the, I had a, cry, a burglary problem in the precinct that I took over, right? So I developed this comprehensive strategy on, and I did all my strategies work the same, same principles, right? You're gonna have, what are you gonna do for the immediate problem? So I have short-term results. What are you gonna do that's gonna kind of give me results two weeks to two months down the road? And then what are you gonna do to build on it so that, a year from now, it, it's still, it's going better, you know? And so I, I made a, like a diagram on how the different actors in my precinct are gonna help with the burglary problem. And included in there were my beat officers and community affairs officers. And I brought everyone into like a, a room and I drew this map, built the map on the wall, you know? Uh, here's the burglary issue and here's how each, pe each player's part in it. The, the sector, the anti-crime team, the beat officer, the community affairs officer. And I did that on purpose so that everyone in the room would recognize that these other cops have a role in the thing that they're working on. That it's a team thing. It's not my issue, it's our issue. When the meeting was over, the community affairs officer actually came up to me to thank me. 
because they not only do they want to get involved with that, they want to feel like they're val- value part of it and other people to realize that they're not just, like you say, making nice to the community and that's it. They actually they're, are still they're cops. real police, yeah. Yeah, they're real cops. And so it's up to, there's, there's not one method for everybody to follow, but wh- whoever the precinct commander is, it's up to him or her to have all the players working with each other as a team. And they're not some other specialized unit that you have nothing to do with. That, uh, that was not the way we did it. To me, the big sort of, I don't know, separation is when you have, if you're not answering calls for service, you're dis, you know, purposefully distinct from patrol. Um, and I always worry about that. Like, I understand you don't want, if someone's got a project, you don't want them answering every call for service. But at some point, if you don't answer calls for service, you're not really understanding the policing needs of the community either. And I don't know how you sort of rectify that. Well, the, the answer to that, by the way, is that for the beat officers, not the community affairs officers, all right? But for the beat officers, this, what's stopping them from answering the call on their beat? You, I would, all right? So you're not going to leave your beat to go, you, can, you can't if you're on a foot post anyway, a foot beat, or, but you shouldn't if you're on a scooter, unless it's an emergency. But you're, you're not on the queue to be assigned jobs. But if a job, from, let's say that domestic violence court comes over the air, and John was working, you know, he, he was in, the, in Lindenwood. You know that John would go over the air and say, uh, whatever is CP, beat, whatever, whatever his number was, will we'll respond to that job. And then the sector call will back him up. You know, it's his community. He's going to go. Anytime I had a foot post when I was a rookie cop, like we, I, I, we didn't have community policing, then, but we had, um, you know, we had robbery posts or whatever. Anything within two blocks of where I was standing, I was going to go over the air and take it because one, I like to work. It's boring to walk around and not do anything. And I'm, I'm a young cop. I want to do police work. You know what I mean? I get eager beaver. And so the beat officers, when they're out there, they will pick up the radio and say, you know, beat. But again, they're only out there five days a week, eight and a half hours, take away the lunch, seven and a half hours a day. And during those seven and a half hours, there could be meetings that they go to. So they're not always on the street. But when they're on the street, they answer the radio. Okay? And then when, if I was doing, like I did a, um, an operation, like the, all my violent crimes were up when I took over the command. But the one crime that was really down was uh, grand loss in the auto, so the nonviolent crime. And that was the number one crime in the precinct numerically. And so by that being down 25%, it, it gave a false picture of my overall crime picture because my overall seven majors were down, yet murder, rape, robbery, burglary, shootings were all up, you know? So uh, it was, but they were smaller numbers. So, it's too, so. Uh, and you see a lot of this today with people saying crime is down. Oh, sure, murders are up 50%. Like, well, no, crime, yeah, it's, it's just numerically, there, there are two categories that dominate the crime numbers. Right, so of course I address the, all those other crimes different ways. But then all of a sudden, like about three quarters of the year, my year there, the, the reduction in GOAs started shrinking. You know, so now I got my robberies, burglaries, sex crimes, shootings, you know, felony assaults. They're all down. I can't afford for GLAs to go up. It would make, totally, you know, distort my accomplishments. So to nip that in the bud, I decided to do a, I, I, read, I read about this somewhere else. And I said, this is a good idea. Let me put my own spin on it. You know, you get good ideas from each other. That's what ComStat's all about. So, um, I decided, I called it Operation Proteus. And what we did is for three weeks in the three main sectors that where GLAs were the most numerous and they were in, in residential communities, it's always over in the midnight tour. They wait for you to be asleep in your bed and your car's parked right in front of your house and they steal it. It's just a you know, dark street, not a lot of traffic, easy to do. So for three weeks, basically. What was the operation name again? Proteus. Proteus, okay. So I... Um, I had no, it was like the Kansas City Preventive Patrol Experiment. Right? No preventive patrol, at least marked preventive patrol in that community. There was no radio cars unless you called for one for three straight weeks in that community. Except what we had instead 
where I had my anti-crime team in an unmarked car and I had my beat officers on bicycles, but not NYPD bicycles. We didn't have bike, bikes yet. Um, their own bicycles in plain clothes. And I had a yellow cab that I got from the street crime unit. And I had a surveillance van that I got from the career criminal apprehension unit. And I had, and so I had this place blanketed with unmarked cars, you know, and unmarked cops, you know, moving around. And the first week I, I added a wrinkle to it, which I think dissuaded people from coming there to commit crime. I had checkpoint outside of Lindenwood, all right, outside of the, that area. Lindenwood was one of those sectors. And I had, um, that was the one thing that was too visible. I had a checkpoint going on out there. So, the so first, to be clear, a checkpoint is when you randomly stop X to a certain number of vehicles and I don't know what you check for. It's, not, it's, uh, it's systematic, all right? In other words, you're not allowed to be, you know, when you do, when you set up a checkpoint, of course of court decisions, you can't just, uh, let me stop BMWs, let me stop. No, by random, I mean statistically random, one in every 10 cars. Right, every third car I stop, every fourth car I stop. Yeah, yeah that way, yes, random that way, yeah. So um, not discretionary here. Not, and right, it's not interesting because unlike most stops, you're not stopping for cause. You're stopping at a truly random, statistically random, con, you know, concept. Right. So anyway, I think the, the checkpoint scared people away. And so the first week we had, we experienced a 53% drop in GLAs and none in that area. No arrests, no crime at all in those three sectors where we have, would have the most of it. All right. So I said, that's fine, but we didn't lock anybody up either for trying to do it. So the second week I removed the checkpoints and left the uh, plain clothes guys there. And we started locking people up and GLAs went down still about 48% or something like that, right? No successful ones in that area. The third week, GLAs were down in the high 30s. We locked up people every single night in that area but again, no one completed the GLA in that area. So, um, but so my point of that story was my beat officers were part of the operation. You know, they were, they got out of the uniform, they put it, got on their bikes and they worked midnights for uh, like at least one of those three weeks. You know, I rotated who had to do it. I didn't want to make, make people do three weeks of midnights. So, but we did it for three straight weeks. So the beat officers in my, in my command were part of everything. You know, they weren't, they weren't pigeonholed as being a separate department that only did that, you know? Now, when they, did the term beat officer, to my former Baltimore City cop days, I was a beat officer because I answered calls, or they were also called it a, you know, post officer. When did beat officer become a special sort of concept? Well, it, yeah, so like you're saying, in the traditional policing back in the 50s, you'd walk a beat. It's just like a post, right? There were synonymous terms. But when community policing took over in New York City in 1990, all right, uh, we started labeling community policing beats versus foot posts. So community policing beats were areas that the beat officer had, whereas they'd be, they could, and they would only, let's say there were 15 in my precinct, but there could be 50 or 60 foot posts, designated foot posts that nobody was ever on, but they existed as, you know, on paper that these posts are there. So if, if we had a, some problem, let's say, we had, um, a, we had one day they had, we had a robbery on Cross Bay Boulevard with had some racial overtones to it because the, there were four kids that were robbed at a bus stop. Three out of the four were white kids. The other kid was, um, I forget what he was, but he wasn't white. And the majority of the kids that robbed them were black. And what it was, it was kids coming home from junior high school, walking to the su subway. They see these kind of kids who look like they had money on them and they ripped them off, you know, at the bus stop. So um, this became a really big deal because one of the victims was a son of the soldier, of a soldier in the Gambino crime family, all right? And um, the, what, what happened, I found out about the robbery and um, which I'm gonna call it, I got, cause I got a call from the, it was literally right in front of the city councilman's front uh, storefront. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Al Stabile. He was pretty big figure, literally a big figure in the community. 
It was like a figure right out of The Godfather. So um, he calls me up, Captain, I had a bias incident here right near my, st my storefront here. I'm going to call New York One, but I like you. I just wanted to give you a heads up first. So I said, Al, don't call anybody. This is a robbery. I, I think one person was still there. One of the victims was still there. I will get to the bottom of this. All right? Trust me, we'll get to the bottom of this. So I, the, the kid was with his grandfather, and then the mother shows up. And I tell them, look, I'm Captain Storch. We're really, you know, we're really sorry what happened to your son. I need you to work with us. We're going to lock up everybody responsible for this. He says, I don't know. I have to speak to my husband. I don't know who her husband is at this point. All right? So we, we take the complaint report, and there, were, there was only one detective in the squad that day. Everybody else had been out on a homicide working the night before. So one guy is holding the fort. And I said to him, look, I got this complaint. There's some community unrest issue with this. Don't let it wait till Monday. Do the preliminary stuff, please, today. I'm going, I, I'm going away for a week starting that Sunday. This was on a Friday because I was going to, you ever hear PMI, Police Management Institute? No, but- It was a graduate leadership oh, program. PMI, yeah, Columbia. Yeah, Columbia. So I was in PMI at the time. So I, I'm going to go away. But I, when I come back, at least I know it's working. So I come back that Monday. I'm in PMI, but I drive all the way down from Tuxedo because that bike patrol thing I was telling you about, it culminated that Monday night with a dinner dance where they were going to now announce how much money they had raised. So I drove down for the dinner dance, you know, to like celebrate, you know, the community raising the funds. And uh, I, I see the squad commander at the party. And I say, hey, Steve, you know, what's happened with that robbery at the, in front of Stabile's? He says, oh man, they lied to us. They, uh, they gave us a phony name and a phony address and the complainant. And so uh, we closed the case. I say, don't close the case. You got, we got to figure this out. So I go to Al Stabile, who's also at the dinner dance. Al, they, the, the baseball field was named after him in the community. He's a, he was a really big figure in the community. I said, Al, you know all these kids. You know who their families are. They gave us a phony name. I need the name of the, the kids that were involved. He says, I'll get it for you. I come back at the end of that week, uh, and Animal, okay? Animal is in the 106. I'm in police headquarters on my day off uh, to see Mike Julian. I don't know if you know Mike Julian. Uh, he was a former chief of personnel, he was a friend of mine. So I'm going to visit him about thanking him about something. And I get a phone call from my precinct. Chief Anamone's here and he's really angry. So I said, put him on. And I say, Chief, isn't this funny? You're in my office and I'm in yours because I was in police headquarters. He says, Artie, I'm about laughing. <laughs> he goes, I, I'm, I am, you're, um, your squad commander closed this case. And what, what, how he found out about it is that the older brother of one of the victims was running buddies with uh, Peter Gotti Jr. Peter, Go Peter Gotti, not Jr., John Gotti Jr., Peter Gotti, the, the, the brother. And uh, she, when the wife, when the mother was putting away the laundry, she found the gun in his drawer. And when she asked him, what's this gun doing here? He says, we're gonna show these black kids they can't mess with the Italians. So she went ballistic. She called Peter, the first deputy mayor, from Giuliani, Peter, I can't remember his name right now. Adam, he calls Animal, and Animal goes to Mike Prison. All right? So with that said, I said, Chief, the case is only closed on paper. I already followed up on it last Monday, you know, this Monday of the week. It, it, we are working on it. Have Al Stabile's gonna get us the names, we're gonna lock these people up. So he said, well, I, I better see results. Otherwise, I'm going to kill your squad commander. <laughs> you know? Animal was, was not shy, you know? Matter of fact, at the end of the year, we both got promoted, me and the squad commander, like a week, either the same week as me or the week later. And I said, Chief, I just want to thank you for promoting not just me, but Steve. And he says, Artie, I was going to chop his legs off <laughs> a year ago, but uh, you guys did a good job. But anyway, so the point of that- to be ill. <laughs> Um, yeah. A face a mother could love. Uh, he was Big yeah. Al, and uh, yeah. Yeah, so he was a city council uh, member for. Um... Yes, I went into his office. They had the Italian music playing, like in The Godfather, the cappuccino machine working. You could smell the cappuccino, <laughs> and he wears big rings. I mean, I, I think people are going to walk in and kiss his ring, you know, like any minute. But he was actually 
of all that, he actually was my biggest supporter in the precinct. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and I didn't kiss up to him or anything. I just showed up at every meeting that of every community group. And when they had a problem, I addressed it. And then all of a sudden at community meetings, because he was at every one that he could go to, he started introducing me as the best precinct commander we ever had. You know, I mean, the next guy, he hated him, got him kicked out of the command. Let, but, me, uh, well, let me ask you about, so I have a crazy idea. Um, I want you to tell me why it's crazy. Uh, if we're going to talk about reimagining police, which as is used usually means um, no policing. Um, I have a concept of truly reimagined policing. Um, there are about 35,000 cops in New York City. Um, there are uh, about 5,000 miles worth of street in New York City. What if you took every cop, now this would be everyone, which I already see the first problem there, but even if you just took half and said, um, you're responsible for 755 feet of this city. That's not much. That's, that's how the math works out. Now, more semi-realistically, let's yeah, just- 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, so let's, take, let's multiply it by 12. Uh, because first of all, half the cops, we're only dealing with half the department that could potentially do this because we're not going to close down the academy. Um, and cops are only working, you know, one sixth of the time. Um, so if you, it's still 9,000 feet. Now you can make it larger in Eastern Queens and smaller in densely popula populated neighborhoods. I mean, at some level, what I, what this is, is just a concept of going back to the the way policing was done for its first hundred and you know 20 years, which is this is your post, this is your beat, you're responsible for it. Um, you could also say you actually are responsible for this segment even when you're not working in the sense you have to, I want you to know who lives here, I want you to know what, what the situations are when you get back to work, you know, you, you should know everything that happens on this small thing. Of course, when you're working, you're gonna have to cover a larger area, but there are a lot of cops. We could do this, we choose not to, um, because it would require, if nothing else, you know, call, res you know, the, it would change response time. It would, it would put, you know, it would be a heavy lift politically. Um, but if we did that and said, here, here's your, you, you are responsible for basically um, a mile of New York City. Um, would crime go down? Um, I think that the, the original community policing model is close to what you're suggesting, with, but not all the way where you're suggesting. And that's what I liked about it though. I liked the fact that you had, I had 15, that's not a magic number. So it could be more like yours than the month. But I liked the idea that I had as many as 15 cops who literally had their small little manageable area and that they, they got to know intimately, right? And in fact, because it was there, they had that kind of possessory feeling towards it. Like, yeah, this is my neighborhood, you know, this is it. And so I, if I'm not here and something bad happens, I'm gonna follow up on it when I come in the next day because I care about these people. I, I, I want that. What the, what the magic number is, I, I don't know, but I like doing that. I like having cops at the granular level. So if instead of having 15 of my cops here, we had 30 of them, which may be more fit what you want, that's okay, I have 150 cops in the precinct. All right, well, I did at, uh, when I was there, all right? So if instead of 15 cops, I had 30 of them doing that, all right? Um, that would have been okay too, all right? This is what I inherited. And so I made work the best I could. 15 is not a magic number. But by having the other ones, there's a lot of police things that you need rapid response for like emergencies. You can't all get there if you're 15, 30 people walking a, a foot. You could, have a, you could have a rapid response unit or two or five. Um, well, because you don't have three sector cars in a precinct working. In, in a, uh, think about it. You're not, that, that model still does that. Because if on, on my late tour, I'd have only like three cars. On my four to 12 tour, maybe I had four cars and maybe similarly on the day tour. So I never had a tremendous amount of cops des designated for that. But they had enough that they could, look, you, you, they could respond and the other guys are still out on the street, you know? Um, so well, what, what percent of the NYPD, do you know, I don't want to put you on the spot on this. What percent of the NYPD is in patrol? Do you, do you know? I mean, generally in police departments, it's about half, but. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's even more so now 
because what Shea did is he got rid of a lot of the specialized units that were on patrol. So the, for his model, um, like in my precinct, we would, under, what I loved about working under the Bratton and, 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 and what thing, the great thing about Animal, all right, I'm, I'm telling you like his rough side, but I, I love the guy, boundless enthusiasm, boundless energy, all right? And he wanted creativity. He didn't want you doing everything the same old way, all right? So I had a virtual free reign in how I staffed my precinct. I, I had no control over who was assigned there, all right? But I even eliminated a citywide program without asking anybody's permission. All right? It was a citywide program. They, it, it, would, it started when I was a rookie cop, which was the expedite, it was an expedited response program actually, right? When the radio used to be busier, they would take one sector car and make it the special car, right? It's called the SP9, SP10 system. And what they would have a, a civilian usually taking jobs off the queue from the radio and that, that were job, past jobs and which just require reports, you know, complaint reports, things like that. Um, and so get those time consuming jobs at five of, and five, they could take five of those jobs and give it to one radio car team that's not on the regular queue, right? And so they would go handle five jobs and they call into that civilian via cell phone. They made it a cell phone uh, when they came around, not in my day. And we'd have to call by regular phone. They give me five more jobs. And we'd go handle five more jobs. So when I did this as a rookie, I was handling like 30 jobs a tour, right? So now I take over the precinct and I'm in this quiet little backwater command. And uh, we're constantly either, uh, we were like the worst in the borough at what we call backlogs and alerts, right? A backlog is like you're yeah, holding three jobs for more than 30 minutes and, you know, and they're not moving, you know? An alert, I don't remember what the exact numbers of these, but that's what they were, right? I'm, I'm listening to the radio. I don't understand how we could be in those situations. So we have an SP9, SP10 car, and I'm looking at what they do. And they're handling like four or five jobs a day, a tour. For You have a team, a civilian, and a cell phone dedicated to four or five jobs. I said, that's a total waste of time. So I just, without asking anyone's permission, I eliminated the program. And I, now, when you eliminate a program, there were six cops assigned to this, you got to realize, right? Was it covered seven days a week, two tours a day? So that's what you call like the scooter chart. So um, the, I said, okay, we got to fix this. I, I had I mean, let me just say, because you, you said it, but I, I think um, if I do turn, use this for a podcast, people aren't, just to go down the math, to get some, to get three shifts seven days a week um, means you it need- was two, It was two shifts, seven days a week. So they work what they call the scooter chart, and where they would be on five off- Two on five or three. Something bas like basically, that. I'm saying is is not not this specific, but in general, you need six cops to have one cop on 24 hours. I mean, so that it quickly gets expensive. These things, but well, you know. three for one, six for two, for two, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, well, they're days off. That's why it's six. And, right. then, and then if you have a partner, then you get up to 12 cops for 24 hour coverage. So quickly, um, it explodes. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. So so. I had, I had the burglary problem. That was like the toughest crime to turn around. Every precinct at the time had one cop assigned to recovering fingerprints at burglary scenes, right? And I was blessed that uh, Chris, um, I, I'd give you her last name because she was the best at it. She was like the best in the borough. Had, again, I inherited her, had nothing to do with me. I inherited the best at getting prints of value and getting hits off those prints. But again, Chris is one human being and she worked five days a week, you know, one tour a day. All right. So I said, you know what? If you, if I went to, if your house was burglarized and Chris now just went off duty. So now she's going to be off for either two or three days. All right. That, that whoever responded to your burglary, the, the, the patrol officer, we have to say to you, uh, Peter, do me a favor. 
don't go to your underwear drawer for the next three days because the perp opened it up and I want Chris to try to get the fingerprints off it. So you have to wear your underwear for the next three days. Is that okay with you? I mean, I'm being facetious, but you get the picture. That's yeah. what was going on. If not the underwear drawer, it could be the, this, this, something, whatever. So I felt like in order to, for this to be successful, we need to be able to take prints that same day when it happened. So I took those six cops, rather than put them back in the barrel, because I'm taking away their detail where they had, you know, they didn't have to work midnight. Back then, you know, we worked the, around the clock. Um, were they working around? Whatever, they had the steady, whatever. So um, I'm trying to think of the timing of this. But anyway, I, I assigned them to be my burglary response team. I took one of my sergeants, and, made, and it was him in this case, made him the burglary sergeant. And I interviewed sergeants for this job. A lot of people applied for it. And I took one of my cops from the precinct and made her my burglary intelligence officer. I literally brought her and another cop who I made my robbery intelligence officer to the borough robbery squad to learn how to look for patterns of crime. You know, how do these guys who do it professionally, how do they find patterns? So I made this, bur so I think the burglary cop, uh, there was a, a detective in the 19th precinct in Manhattan. Every precinct had like a, a computer guy assigned to it. They called him the land coordinator. Mm -hmm. he, he, this detective, like worked with the land coordinator to write a program to do crime analysis of burglaries because it wasn't, we didn't have the packages that we have today, right? Our system back, we didn't have uh, computerized 61s then, you know, complaint reports. It was all handwritten stuff, right? So, um, Did you anyway. know um, Billy Gorta? Yeah, he was one of the computer guys. Yeah, that's why. Yo, with yo. Yeah, I've yeah. spoken to both of them. Um, I, yeah, I know both. They, they both, they probably remember me. I know them both. Yeah, nice guys. Okay. Go, go, Gordon was a sergeant, I think. And yeah. Yo, he, yo, yo, yo was a he lieutenant. He might have been a lieutenant, I forget. I think he was a sergeant. I think well, he right. could have made lieutenant after my time. But I think at the time of, of Comstat, the early days of Comstat, I think he was a detective, a sergeant. But he I said it was his job to go to precincts and bang heads to get, to get this stuff. Right, right. So think about it, we, none of that was computerized then. The only thing that was in the computer back then was uh, I think the GLAs, that's it. So the other six Comstack crimes weren't there, right? So, um, so I actually, I, 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 so this detective and that guy wrote a program for burglaries, all right? And I had a friend who worked in the 19th precinct. She told me about it. I went to the 19th precinct. They gave me a copy of the program. I asked MISD to install it, you know, in my intranet. And, uh, and, I, and I had this officer, I can't remember her name anymore, uh, learn the program. And she started developing patterns of burglaries. The, uh, I also had, again, we, this wasn't in the precincts yet, but they were using it at Comstat, Map Info, you know, uh, you know, computerized crime mapping. So I had that installed in my precinct, right? And I had, um, I don't remember who I had learned it. Maybe she had her learned it. I don't remember who I had learned it. And um, so she would now start developing patterns and being able to put them on the map and we'd be able to put them on the wall. And now the cops knew what they were looking for when it came to burglars. And uh, what's a funny story about this is that um, when I, crime, we, we had a lot of success. So crime was going down tremendously in my command, burglaries went down. Uh, someone from the Times came and interviewed me, Lenny Levitt, uh, from, who had his own column uh, at 1PP Confidential. He, he passed, just, passed away not too long ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and someone from the Reader's Digest interviewed me, all right? I get a letter in the mail from my 99 year old uncle who lived in a nursing home in Florida that he read about my crime program in the Reader's Digest. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, that's what they encouraged at a moment. So when I went to Comstat and I said, listen, I, I stopped the, the SP9, SP10 program because we were only doing four jobs I, I moved these guys to this program and our burglaries have been going down ever since. 
animal and said, good idea. If I had asked permission on the front end, I don't think I would have gotten it, you know? But th the good thing about animal is that he, he didn't care about what was traditional. He cared about getting results. And so I felt empowered during, between him and Maples, Maples is very creative, to like experiment. Not every experiment's gonna work, some things, you know, but I don't, you don't get killed what doesn't work as long as nobody gets killed and you're not breaking any laws. But if you, if, but if you make in, you know, in, intelligent decisions, more things will work than not. And crime, you know, crime went down as a result. So I just uh, pulled up a New York Times article from 1998. It says here, Deputy Inspector Arthur Storch, who is commanding officer of Brooklyn South Narcotics Bureau, investigated and oversaw the operation, citing the 21 search warrants served during the operation and said police would follow dealers indoors, which is another issue of pushing the drug market indoors was a major contributor to the crime drop. Exactly. Deputy Inspector Storch said he hoped police efforts would be bolstered by the housing authority's new one strike you're out policy, which mandates the eviction of any oh. housing project tenant convicted of a felony. Do that you, was a, a Red Hook case, the Red Hook case. Um, one strike and you're out sounds pretty harsh. Do you still, do you stand by this, sir? They already have a program like that. It's the, um, it's, a, the it's an addiction program. It's the um, narcotics eviction program for housing developments. The idea being that if you are a drug dealer and you're getting free housing from the city, then we don't, you're, you're basically a cancer to that. Uh, development and we need to get you out of there so that when we took over when we did that case there were six gangs that operated in red hook houses and the surrounding blocks and uh, it, for four and a half months we embedded uh undercovers there all right i won't exactly say how we do because you're podcasting this but uh we made 206 case buys into over 160 drug dealers in those four and a half months. And uh, that's when, and then we had, I think we started off with about 13 search warrants and then we developed more search warrants as the, as we debriefed prisoners uh, there. And so, yeah, the, for, do I have a problem with one strike and you're out of the, if you're a drug dealer, I don't have a problem. If you're a user, no. I mean, if you're a, you're a drug addict who is addicted and, but you, 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 yeah, and by the way, you being evicted doesn't mean your family's being evicted in, in this program. It means you're not allowed to be uh, on the program, on the facility. But this, um, I think, can, would, it, you know, I, I mean, I remember at the time, but also especially today, would be a, not a very popular um, program for many. Um, what do we do about the poor person and where is he going to live? Uh, are, are the homeless people we see on the subways, are these just all drug dealers evicted from NYCHA, NYCHA houses? Well, uh, again, we're not evicting your family. We're evicting the dealer. All right. So your family is not homeless. You now, again, it may not be a lifetime ban, but, you know, it's an idea behind maybe if we put this pressure there, that the family themselves will put pressure. Look, we executed a warrant one time in, uh, in a housing de uh, development in Rockaways when I was in Queens Narcotics, right? What happened in this case, this drug dealer uh, got into a verbal uh, tiff with a beat officer, all right? And uh, he like tried to intimidate the beat officer because he was the local drug dealer. You know, and the beat officer was a young, big, strapping cop and wouldn't back down, and the drug dealer backed down. So he was now humiliated in front of his peers. He put a contract on the life of that cop. He was going to have him killed. Right. So we found out about that during our inf narcotic enforcement, and we identified not only him but everyone that he had any dealings with because we didn't know who would pick up this contract. All right. And our goal was to lock every one of them up to prevent this from happening. All right. It culminates in a search. What was the contract for? Do you know? Do you remember? I think it was like 10,000 bucks, if I remember correctly. This is back in 1995 um, or six. Right? That's the years I was in Queens and Right. Um, 96 to 98, Brooklyn South, 98 to 2000, Manhattan North. Narcotics. So um, 
that culminates in a search warrant on his apartment. We execute the warrant, he's not there, but the drugs are right there on the dinner table and his grandma was there. So we locked her up, right? Because the presumption in the law is everyone from that apartment. Now we figured that we don't want grandma to go to prison, that he would just do the right thing and turn himself in, but he didn't. He didn't, he was a real punk. He punked out from the cop and he punked out from his grandmother. So people from the community started marching on the DA's office, get grandma, go. And so of course they let grandma go. It is a presumption in the law, but they don't have to prosecute, right? right. We eventually did get him. All right? But the point of what I'm saying is that that guy should have been kicked out of that apartment. Grandma should be left alone without that guy there. You know, that's all I'm saying. So okay. how do you blend? So we, we shifted or I shifted from sort of the, I don't even like these labels, but for shorthand, we shifted from the softer side of policing to the harder side, from from community, uh, you know, policing to, to narcotics uh, raids. Um, tie it together. How does this all tie into to effective policing? Well, again, think about it this way. All right. You buy, buy a home like in, like in my priest. Remember, I said only one piece of the community was apartment buildings, right? The rest of the community were homes. And it was really, the, my community economically went from working class to upper middle class, all right? So let's go to the working class side for a second, all right? You're in the working class community, you, you, you work hard, you, you probably your spouse works also, your kids get old enough, they work also, and you buy this house, that's the American dream. A lot of immigrants moved into my community. That's the American dream. Some drug dealer takes over his parents' apartment when they pass away, their house when they pass away. And he starts selling drugs out of there, private prostitutes in there, whatever the case may be. It, it, it's, it's attracting people to his house, to your block, who are criminals who would think nothing of committing a robbery on that block, committing a burglary on that block, stealing the car on that block, all right? Or getting into fights with where innocent people get hurt on that block, all right? So we, the community beat officer is the one person that maybe the other homeowners trusts to say, listen, ever since Johnny's parents went away, that place has been attracting, before people get shot, I'm talking about where it comes to our attention, there's something going on in that bot house. It shouldn't be going on. Now, the beat officer can't do covert investigations. You need an investigative unit to do covert investigations. Mm -hmm. So we get a complaint from the community that something's going on in that house, All right? Now, if it's just as amorphous as that, we can't go up and knock on the door and say, hey, uh, I, I hear you sell drugs. Can I buy some drugs from you? You know, no one isn't gonna happen. All right, so now we're, we're required to do some enforcement of maybe people leaving that house. You know, lock up some people when we, when we can see them doing something illegal, all right? Lock them up, debrief them, and find out without telling them what it is we wanna know, what's going on in that house, all right? I'll give you a good, give you a good example of how this could actually work and did work in real life, right? I had this lieutenant, I think I said this to you, about the you make you a hero, get you indicted. Did I say this to you or did I tell that story to someone else? No, oh, I, don't I told remember. the story to someone else. Uh, oh, oh, from John Jay. I was talking to uh, someone from the Do It yesterday. Uh, I, got, I got some uh, license for that Camtasia program. So, um, so anyway, what the, when I took over my precinct, I visited the former precinct commander and went over the roster, you know, and he talked to, talk to me about the lieutenant, his lieutenant who's his, special operations lieutenant, the person in charge of community policing, the anti-crime team, all the specialized units. And he said, Gary, I'll give you his last name. He said, Gary is really innovative. He's full of energy. Uh, he's really, you know, really talented. He'll either make you a star or get you indicted. <laughs> so having survived the 3-0 precinct, which later had that big scandal, you know, after I left there, indicting, getting indicted was not an option. So I called him into my office you know, and I said to him um, what, what I was told. I said, Gary, I, I am happy about your creativity, your enthusiasm. 
we're just not going to take any shortcuts. We're just going to do everything for the right reason. And I'll be there with you. Right. And so I was every search warrant, I would definitely let him go home. I would go there, you know, on every warrant. But anyway, he was a really prideful bully of a guy, this, this Gary. All right. Always intimidating the cops and the other sergeants and the sergeants because they outranked him and he was a kind of a bull of a guy. Uh, he's the best cop in the precinct. Blah, blah, blah. So one day, the actual best cop in my precinct and one of my best sergeants were coming back from court. They get out of the train and walk the three blocks to the precinct and they identified the 106 precinct worst burglar of the year before. He had gone to jail for a year and now he just got out and they saw him right away. They said, what's, uh, I forget his name. So what's this guy up to? So they, instead of keeping walking back to the precinct, they just stayed there and watched him. And he was with his girlfriend and there was a truck delivering electronics goods to a store and the truck driver left the keys in the ignition. So the burglar and his girlfriend literally get into the car <laughs> truck from both sides of the truck and they're going to drive it away when my sergeant and police officers swoop in and lock them both up. Right? They bring him into the station house and they say to the lieutenant, hey, Lou, we've been here for like five minutes. We locked up the number one burglar. You've been here all day. What have you done? You know, because he's always busting their chops. They just had to give him one. Well, he couldn't take that. He couldn't take that, even that good natured ribbing. He walks out of the precinct by himself. Five minutes later, he comes in with a guy in handcuffs. <laughs> Some poor schnook walking down Liberty Avenue smoking a joint. He locks him up. All right, which now you're not going to lock them up for anymore. All right, but here's the point of that story. We did my policy, and it was citywide policy, but I enforced it in my precinct. We debriefed every prisoner. We don't care what we lock you up for. You, if we locked you up for jaywalking, which we didn't do, we still debrief you. We want to know what you know. That guy who was smoking a joint, all right, gave us four search warrants, all right, for drug locations. So that's so. My point is, that's how this all works together. That house that is going bad, this guy maybe went there that day. We went to a house. Uh, one of the locations was a house in the 102 precinct right next door. Same kind of community, private homes, but the, guy, but the young people, they were dr dealing drugs. And then it were two houses in the 103 precinct and one in mine. Four search warrants, one in my precinct, you know, it's three in the other two precincts. And... So you need both. You need the enforcement and you need the community. You want to prevent crime from occurring completely. That's what our beat officers are there for, right? But what we do have, we still have to deal with it. So I got two questions um, related to this. Mm -hmm. I want to get to them both, actually. Um, this cop, and let's not mention his name because I want to use him as an archetype, this Ball busting, hard charging, corner cutting cop. Ramon probably knows who he is. Well, um, well, I'm not going to give you his last name because I, you know, especially as a podcast. But yeah, he's a lieutenant from the 106, Gary. You don't know who he is. Um, <laughs> he, many people would say, and I don't know him from from Adam, uh, is part of the problem of policing. Um, I don't know if you're how familiar you are with the Baltimore scandal, the gun trace task force, but a similar situation there in which um, the cop who, well, one of the cops who's now in prison was, you know, considered the, 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 the greatest cop since sliced bread, if to misuse an analogy. Um, and uh, at some point, I mean, you were worried this guy was going to get you indicted. Um, well, I might be considered were able to supervise him properly, so he didn't. Um, but he strike this guy, the, the red flags galore. Um, right. with, with the wrong management, he's gonna start committing crimes and give a well, black not crimes, but not co corruption. See, that, that's the thing. It wasn't a corruption problem with him. The, the indicted part was the violating civil rights would be, which is wrong, right? Which is why I was there. And then people come up to me and say, I, I, I'm so happy you come out and search warrants you know, because he was like on the police and, you know, we can cut corners. No, you can't cut corners. You just do it the right way. And it takes longer to do it. it takes but he longer. was cutting corners until you got there. So right. how do we stop after that? I left, he got dumped out of my precinct. How do you stop that from happening at an organizational level? Well, um, because I mean, not only was he tolerating, may have not been like personally, but to some extent he was, by some, he was lauded, yeah. right? Because he gave- No, I know what you're saying. Yeah. The, well, look, 
if he actually does violate it, then he has to get, he has to be admonished and maybe dis and disciplined and maybe removed for doing it. I was warned that that would be his tendency. And, but it also was just a bully. You know what I mean? Like he was a bully. He was like, one time, like he really didn't like that I came out on all the warrants. Now captains have to go. But when it first started, a lieutenant could do it. Then captains had to go, right? So he was not happy that I had to do it, that I was going on every warrant and I wouldn't just let him be in charge of it. And I let him be in charge of it in a sense. I just went from room to room to room, making sure that we did everything the right way. We don't have to trash this person's house. We don't have to, we just have to search this person's house. You know, we, and we have to search well, right? I, there are malicious searches. I mean, they have the trashing the person's house beyond right. what is needed for a search. Yes, we don't need to do it. Vindictive. We don't need to intimidate anybody. We're already there, you know? I mean, the way search warrants are done at the precinct level, ESU makes the entry. So we don't actually do, we don't have to be rough with anybody. The, the, the emergency service created what they called the A-team. And the A-team were the specialists, but any ESU could do it. But the A-team were the specialists at executing warrants. So a, the A-team would go in, boom the door, handcuff everybody. They take a step back, the precinct would walk in and do the search. So we, we don't have to be in that enforcement rough mode at all. The place has been totally made safe for us by the, you know, the superstars. In narcotics, we did it ourselves. But anyway, the, the, with Gary, um, there was an, oh, so he, the point of my story, real fast end to the story, is I was coming in from home. There was a search warrant at night, let's say eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. So I had gone home, or maybe I was going to work a late tour because I was going to do the warrant. I don't know. So I allowed the anti-crime team to use my car. The captain's car is an unmarked car. So I told him I'm going to be in by like eight o'clock. So the anti-crime team came in like at 8.05. He was angry at, at me because I'm going out on the warrant. He's not really angry at them, but he, but you know, like shit flows downhill. So he, they show up and I, I couldn't hear what was being said, but I heard it was like a brouhaha in front of the station house. I walk out of my office to find out what's going on. And the best cop in the command, the one who I told you about made that collar is an anti-crime team. He goes, that's not right. That's not right. And I, I said, what happened? And basically what happened is Gary screamed at the, the sergeant from the anti-crime team in front of the entire community because he was five minutes late with the car. I didn't say to Gary, where's my car? I didn't say, hey, what the hell's, why is it my car here when I got here? He just wanted to yell at somebody because he was pissed off. So he, anyway. He sounds like an asshole. He's a boy. Right. So I, I don't came, want him on the job. Right. So I came in the next day I had the duty. And I only found out about this later, right? So I come in the next day and I call him into my office and I'm going to get him kicked out of my precinct. You know, if he doesn't do something to change my mind. So he comes in and he said, I just want you to know, I apologize to Saran, Samaj, the sergeant, I forget his first name, it's an Indian name. And I said, let me ask you a question, Gary. Did you apologize to him in front of the station house, in front of all the other anti-crime members, and in front of all the, the neighbors, like you yelled at him? And, oh. I said, Gary, I, I, you know, I'll tell you the truth, I was ready to kick you out of this precinct. I wanted you to apologize to him the right way. And if this ever happens, I will get you out of this precinct. It's not easy to do that. But, but this is what I'm asking, not so much about him in particular, but that's why I said I'm using him because I don't know him as a, as a type. Um, I mean, or maybe you disagree. I don't, I don't want that guy on the job. I think he's bad for, for the organization. He's bad for policing. Had you been able to kick him out of the precinct, he would have taken his bad attitude somewhere else. The, the citizens yeah. of New York wouldn't have benefited. Yeah, no, it's true. But you, you have to catch him doing something wrong other than being like, I could give him a dis something what he just did. I could have given him a complaint. You know, I could have given him what we call a command discipline and uh, taken days away from him. But there's no way in the world in civil service I could have separated him from the job based on that incident. Now, if he has a series of them, then you get put into a, again, without anybody being hurt, we're talking about. We have these monitoring programs that you can be separated from the department. But in any civil service system, you, you, it's not like, hey, you're not my kind of employee, you're out. I have to get, catch you wrong. Now, an allegation was made against Gary for stealing money out of a cash register. Uh, 
And IEB came to me to set him up. So I said, I'll, I'll absolutely set him up, no problem. I don't think he steals, I just think he's a bully. And then, and people resent him, and so that's why they make allegations. But I will do it, all right? So I set him up, I sent him to this location. Uh, they had done like an underage drinking operation there. Was this with Campisi running uh, Internal Affairs? Yeah. So, uh, and I was in Internal Affairs for a year as an inspector, right? The, um, so what happened is they, we get a complaint from the public that this bodega, I was hoping to pull out Campisi's book. It's a good one. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking about. Anyway, I have a complaint from the public that this bodega was selling beer to kids, teenagers. So we would take our cadets who were under 21 and we'd send them in there to buy beer. So they didn't give us any money for this. It wasn't like buy money sent to us. So literally, Gary would take a $5 bill out of his pocket. We'd Xerox the bill so you'd see the serial number and send the undercover, the kid to buy the beer. After he sold the beer to the kid, we would take law enforcement action and we'd take that back the $5 bill, the same serial number that we had given him, right? And that was the proof of the sale, right? So he was just angry. So he made an allegation that he stole money. So IAB put up, cameras all over the place, speakers all over the place. I had to send Gary there twice because I sent him there the first time. He never actually walked into the store. He sent the sergeant in to do it. <laughs> so I, he says, we're gonna have to do it again. I said, Gary's not stupid, man. This will be the third time I'm gonna send him to this place. He says, they say, look, we're gonna leave all the cameras up. Whenever you feel like you could do it, do it. And we'll just keep it running until we finally get him. So I had to wait like three more weeks. I send him back in again. This time he went in and he didn't, he didn't again. He doesn't, he's not dishonest that way. He's just, he's, he, I agree with you. He's, he's, not, he's not the kind of guy that we want on the job, but he, he passed the psychological. I don't know how, but um, he's like the dirty Harry guy. You know, that's that kind of police officer. He's not going to steal anything. Because in just, some ways, I, I think in terms of policing, <laughs> he that is a, is a bigger problem like we all agree that if you're a criminally corrupt cop like no there's no argument on that front if you're a criminally mm -hmm. corrupt cop you should be fired charged whatever um the tougher part is the people who just who constantly make people hate cops right so i agree with you and so the only though how i dealt with it with him is not allow him to not accept that in my command right it was you know I talked to the, every, we had, I don't know how they do it today because everybody gets direct deposit. But back in those days, you actually got paychecks. So the tradition in the, the police department was every payday because people come in from home on their day off to get their paychecks. We would have a meeting and you could give like one hour of comp time to anybody who's off duty to, to come to the meeting, all right? So I would talk to them from day one about how we treat people and how, it's, how we treat each other and all that stuff. And what you know, that just wasn't acceptable in my command. I, I had, a, 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 look, I had to, I've had to deal with this, this attitude. I inherited people with who had that attitude because I was accepted and you have to end that attitude, right? I had, a, I had a point where the cops on, the sergeants on the midnight tour who had the desk, they weren't mean to the public. They were just mean to the cops, right? Uh, like the, the first hour of, of a pre, of a, of a, something's op opening up here. Hey, Chief, how are you? <laughs> hey, excellent, Artie, how are you? Good, good, good. I was saying such nice things about you, we decided to connect us. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Peter. So we're talking about sometimes people who are uh, either, who have a bad attitude, you know? Yeah. And, I, and the chief will tell you, the first hour of the tour for the desk officer is the worst hour of the day, right? Because they literally give the desk officer a, about 80 things to do to st in that first one hour, you know, including yeah. in the property, inspecting the station house, the arrests, the, all this stuff, right? So it is a little hectic and you, you want to get it out of the way. It, well, for whatever reason, the sergeant who had the desk in the 106 on the late tour would, would allow that to make him a miserable human being. 
right? And of course, I, never to me, but to the other cops. So yeah. I, a sergeant comes up to me and says, listen, boss, I just want to tell you from this 4 to 12, my cops won't make any arrests at the end of the 4 to 12 because they don't want to deal with the desk officers on the late tour. <laughs> and I said, we can't have that. <laughs> we can't have that. And then I had, on top of it, do you remember the captain from the task force chief who was a great guy, the Queen South task force? Really nice guy. He comes yeah. up to me and he says, Artie, I got to pull my cops out of the 106. Because they would bring in collars up to the desk on the late tour, and this guy would just give him a hard time, and I yeah. have to pack my cops. I say, look, I understand. I will deal with those sergeants, but I, you know, please bring them back another day. And I had to I deal with these guys. They weren't mean to the public. They were just mean to cops. And, yeah. you know, I had to, I did it, I think the right way is I would brought in the lieutenant first, and I said, look, here's what I'm hearing about your sergeants, my lieutenant always wanted to be on patrol. He was a hands-on yeah. guy. He didn't like being behind the desk. I yeah. said, I'm willing to talk to these guys. He says, no, please let me talk to them. <laughs> that, <laughs> that ended that day. It ended that day, you know? But yeah, it's up to the whoever's in charge to, to not allow attitudes. I mean, you will have, you know, rebels without a cause and they slip through the cracks and then they get in trouble and they get jammed up. But the, really, the attitude starts from the top down, you know, and, and uh, that's why we need the right leaders. Because you've got this yeah. organization, you've got civil service, so you, and you it's certainly not, can't fire them just because they're jerks. I mean, that's no, the, you fire, you uh, have to document things. They can be fired, cops do get fired, but it, it, it has to be more than like what I was saying to you before. You know, yeah. being a bit of a bully. Being, but if, if you build up a a rap sheet of these things. Then now we can put you in a monitoring program, which is, that's it, you're on dismissal probation. One more strike and you're out, you know, and, and then you could be out with a minor strike. Lou, I was saying before the problem, that we're not talking about criminally corrupt issues here because those are in a way no brainers and we're all against it. Right, exactly. It's, it's the general bad attitude. The reason the guy who goes out and in every shift makes somebody hate police, um, that is not good for the organization or policing or the community. Well, how, how, do you, how do you fix it? Well, I, mean, I think we do what we were talking about before. I, I really think that this idea of real community policing, get them out of those cars, all right? The kind of community policing that we had back then, Chief, you know, back in 1994, we had combat yeah. and community policing at the same time, all right? And so we're fighting crime. And so the public actually sees crime going down. But at the same time, there's a cop in their co local community that they know by name and recognize and, and knows that cares about them and that they can, conversely, they care about him or her. And I think that's where we have to be. I, I, I think the secret is actually getting cops out of cars. How you want to do that is, you know, we, we could discuss, but I think that is the key ingredient. There's no policing that goes on in a cop car. Yeah. But you need sector cars for those jobs, but you... So you have a minimum amount for that, but you need be, you need beat officers. Exactly. So let me just uh, give you a, a little bit here based on what I'm hearing, guys. All right, you just five or ten minutes, Peter. To the uh, to your point about how do you do this, you have to do it through your leaders, through those precinct commanders, unit commanders. They have to understand from the people that Artie was talking about. You know, from the top down that this is the way it's got to be. This is the way we're going to work. And I don't have to, you know, fire you, I don't think, to gain your compliance. Willingly or unwillingly, there are enough tools for any commander to gain compliance with what he wants or she wants done. Absolutely. Remember, Chief, when two things, I remember one came out of your mouth. <laughs> the one that came out of your mouth, I always remember. The, a big thing that, uh, a big issue that came up, remember the wanted cards, right? Yeah. Uh, right. And so it used to be that if a detective solved the crime, but they couldn't catch the guy, they just put out a wanted card. And it's not a warrant, but it's a notice to other cops that if you see this guy, don't let him go. I, I want him. He's, you know. So yeah. this one precinct squad, detective squad, had like about 100 outstanding warrant cards. <laughs> and as we were walking out of Comstat, the squad commander is walking by the chief and he said, John, you're on life support, and the beeps are slowing <laughs> down. <laughs> I remember that to this day. <laughs> but that's all that had to happen. That's, that's it. That's all that had to happen. 
And then the other one was from, from Commissioner Braddon. In the early days of ComStat, I remember him coming to the meeting and he got up and said, this is where the train is going. This is the direction it's going. Get on the train or get right. off. <laughs> and that's all you have to say, you know? And you, and by the way, it wasn't the threat of it. It was, it was, part, it was part of the inspiration because it came up, the beginning of that statement was, you're gonna look back and we do, right? Yeah. Part, you're gonna look back 20 years from now, and now it's more than 20 years from now. And you're gonna say that you were part of the team that turned this city around. And trust, and I, that's all we do. <laughs> and I and I used I used that uh, that expression at every sergeant, lieutenant, captain training class. Anytime I addressed anybody who was getting promoted, I used it all the time. Yeah, and, and guys buy into it, you know. Yeah, I, I walked out of the cops that wanted to bring climb down five more percent. I'm, I'm yeah. telling you, and I I'm, I'm not saying this because you're on the phone because I said it five minutes before you were on here. The great thing about that time, I will, I was, I described that time by the way. I didn't say this to you before, Peter, as the Camelot year yeah. of NYPD. Yeah, I've heard that exact term from yeah. many people, by the yeah. way. It really is, was yeah. because we were encouraged to be creative. You, that you would say, look, when you were publishing those crime strategy booklets, and I think you got as Chief gave them to you, right? When you when those crime strategy booklets came out, basically what they said are, here are all the tools. At your disposal. Yeah, got I got those crime, those booklets yeah. right here. There you go. <laughs> you are all the tools at your disposal. All right. And um, now, you know, and go come up with a solution to your local problem. This is not the blueprint that you have to follow. This is the like the germ of the idea for you to create the local. Yeah. And I, I literally did, Chief, read every one of those booklets over a weekend. Right, yeah. I stayed in, read every booklet, and sat there with paper and and d- design strategies for my crimes. So I go to my first CompStat meeting, Peter, uh, and I'm ready to talk about. It. I'm waiting for the chief to give me a hard yeah. question about robberies, burglaries. I'm ready to hit him, and instead he goes to me, "Is it the same business as usual in the 106?" that when somebody calls their TS for a car to come, nobody comes. Yes. <laughs> and that was the business. And it was true. And I, yeah. I had noticed it. That's why I smiled because I got letters in the mail that must've went through his office that said, I call the precinct about noise. Nobody comes. When I call back, they're rude and discuss. And they literally <laughs> went out the game of the police officer. And I found out chief that they weren't even logging those calls on the TS remark. Right. They were putting right. it on a scrap piece of paper, giving it to a team coming off a meal who would throw it in the garbage can on the way out. Yeah. The <laughs> And so we address that, which is really important, by the way. Taking care of those minor issues really makes a difference about how you're, you're perceived. And then, so after I described what I did about that and about the people waiting for to see the 124 room, the chief's, oh, good. So and he went around the whole room of 15, 14 other precinct commanders in Queens when it was one borough. So what are you doing about that? And they would go, yeah, I do the same thing Artie does. <laughs> <laughs> I was cracking up. But so I was oh. telling Artie earlier, I was saying, um, you know, I've been working on this book slowly for years. I think you were literally the first person I interviewed for it, maybe, or one of the wow. first. Suddenly we're in a situation where um, we might have to revisit the great New York crime drop of the 90s that you played such a such a big part of. Before we were saying a bit that things went off, started to go off the rails a year or two, or Artie was saying, uh, you know, a year or two after Bratton left. You were there a bit longer. Now, even after, so Bratton, Left in what ninety six? He got 96, April ninety six. He got he got fired by Giuliani because Bratton was on the cover of Time magazine, and Giuliani's ego couldn't handle that. Um, right. Now, let's be honest: between Giuliani, Bratton, Jack Maple, and Chief Animal, and there's some big egos in that room. Um, it might not be able to hold them all. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you, and you forgot Timony. <laughs> okay. um, no, Timony. But yeah. murders did continue. In 96, I'm looking at this here. I don't know this off the top of my head. 983 homicide murders in New York City. You know, and we can and it would drop another 50 and then more, you know, 60, 70 percent. Um, how did things keep going right if, if the leadership at the top wasn't? Um... Yeah, well, here's my opinion, Chief, and you can correct yeah. it from your perspective because you're looking at higher than me. But my perspective yeah. is that the commissioners that followed Bratton 
they understood that Comstat's really important, and that that's the I always call it the engine that brought crime down. But those those people that replaced him were first of all they weren't really police officers, some of them, all right. They didn't understand the importance of community policing, and so it, it took a few years for it to die out. But community policing started dying out, and at some point, so we, we lost the the connection to the community, but we're still doing the strategic crime fighting, right? We're still doing a lot of the same programs that we were doing before to bring crime down, but we, but we lost that that part that made the community love us. <laughs> you know, that's the part we lost. But then eventually, uh, you know, what happens, like I say, when the stop and frisk became a unit of productivity as opposed to just a tool to document your the reason for stopping someone. Yeah. All right. You're absolutely right, Artie. Yeah, we started creating animosity in, yep. about it. And so that's why it's hard to just ratchet up the enforcement today. Nobody, nobody's in the mood for us stopping a lot of people on the street just to search for guns anymore. That's not what they want. They want us to be effective, but at the same time, they want to feel like they have an input into what we're doing. This is somewhat of the needle I'm trying to thread when I get asked about this and talk about it publicly, is I do think um, in the past year in particular, in the past few years in general, um, there has been a lack, I mean, there's been a demonstrable decline in enforcement. That's that's without doubt. Um, and I think that has caused the violence increase, um, is less policing. It's not the only thing, but oh, I yeah, think no, it's- absolutely. But so, but I'm afraid, but the problem is I can imagine the response to that being, okay, go out there and get me numbers. We, <laughs> Moscow says we need enforcement. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's when disaster strikes. So like you have to, you, you want to secretly look at those numbers as a proxy for what's going on. But once you start talking about numbers, also oh, stop and frisk, because we talked about it earlier, but, um, and again, they're probably underreported in the early days and then overreported in its peak. But it went yeah. up from 100,000 in 2002 to nearly 700,000 in 2011. That was the peak year. I mean, yeah. that's a yeah. lot of stops. Right. That, but that's for what I was telling you. And as we were saying, a lot of some of those were our students going to our class. To me, yeah. that's the arrogance of Ray Kelly. No, I, no offense if you're friends with him. But to me, that was the thing I could look. I, I like to give credit what credit is due. So the counterterrorism program of NYPD, I put a lot of that to the credit of Ray Kelly, because that was his vision. But yeah. the stop and frisk abuse, I put at his feet as well, because I told you, people complained to him, and he was, gave arrogant responses to it. You know? But look, John Cougar Mellencamp has the answer to this, right? In one of his songs, he says, I know there's a balance. I see it every time I swing past. So the <laughs> point is not to go past the balance and overreact and go the other way, right? The idea is to say, hey, stop and frisk is not evil. It's, it's how it's abused could be. The worst, the most misdiagnosed program is broken windows. Broken windows is not evil. There's nothing yeah. about broken windows that says every person has to be arrested for every minor offense. That's not what Commissioner Bratton told us. That's not what the chief told us. Right. What they told us at Comstat was you can't be a conscientious objector. If someone breaks the law in front of your face, you're a police officer. You have to make sure they don't continue to break the law. You could do it with a warning. You could do it with a summons. You could do it with an arrest. But the thing is, you can't have them keep doing it while you're there. That's not, that's, you're not, you're not involved. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And the chief used to send... So the issue is you actually have to address these quality of life, broken windows issues, but it doesn't have to be hard handed. Well, it's about changing behavior. What is broken windows? Signs of lawless and breed lawlessness. That's all it is, right? That's all it says. There's nothing evil about that observation, all right? And so, so graffiti, we used to, we, we, a beat officer, like we're talking about before, one of my beat officer that had Liberty Avenue liaisoned with a hardware store on Liberty Avenue who donated endless amount of silver paint and sprayers, all right, to, to, for the gates. And the, the um, law enforcement explorers that worked in my precinct, right, and what I called the, um, the guys we locked up for graffiti who were sentenced to community service, all right, every Sunday morning, painted over the graffiti. That's actually the best thing you could do to fight graffiti. Yeah. Because yeah. if they can't keep it up there, they don't want to paint there. <laughs> you know, so look, I, I like locking up bad guys. 
right? So I'm, I'm never going to apologize for that, right? That's the, to me, was the, part of the fun of being a police officer. Part, I also enjoyed the service part, right? So it wasn't the only fun. But not every issue requires an arrest or requires a massive arrest. Look, when I looked at the rape problem, if you, I don't, you might remember this, Chief, when I took over my precinct, rapes were up, right? That's one of those violent crimes that were up. And I, I read every complaint. And what it came down to, 75 to 80% of the rapes occurred indoors, 75 to 80% occurred between people high school age and younger, and 75 to 80% occurred between people who had in some way acquainted to each other, with each other. So that means I could have had what you wanted, Peter. I could have had a cop on every street corner 24 hours a day, and 75 to 80% of those rapes would not have been prevented. All right? Yeah. So the answer was what? That you know, we have two overriding issues that I saw there. Date rape kind of rapes and incest. We had a few, several, we had a handful of incest rapes, right? And, so, and it was like a cultural thing. Anyway, so I went, I spoke at every uh, school's assembly. I spoke at every church, synagogue, mandir, mosque, say about what this issue problem is, and that no means no. And you can trust the police to share the problem. And you can trust us to also deal with the problem. One high school student must have been absent that day or thought I was just spinning my wheels. And literally, within a week, did a date rape. I didn't even refer that to special victims. I sent my sergeant to the, that guy's house and had him locked up. Rape went down 40%, one arrest. One yeah. arrest. Rape went down 40%. So it was mostly education. That guy had to be arrested. He did it. Case closed. But yeah. by, by, by having talked to everyone, that arrest now resonated. Oh, shit. He's tell, he, he meant it when he said he's going to lock us up, you know? Yeah. And, look, they surveyed high school kids, this is many years ago, back then. And it's amazing how many of them said, yeah, you, you, three dates and sex is owed. You know, I mean, yeah. like, there was no asking. It's owed. No, it's not. Nothing is owed that you don't want to give. You know, and and so it's just a matter of spreading that go the gospel, and then backing it up with one action. That's all it took. Yeah, that's all it took. So, so Petey, you're getting a good sense just listening to Artie. You know what a what a, a, a good thinking, motivated precinct commander can accomplish. And why can't we do that in 77 precincts throughout the city? That's what you need. Now, as to, you know, how come crime continue to go down? I'm going to jump on uh, Artie's point. Safer was, was not a cop. Right. He had no clue. It took him six weeks of sitting in on these meetings. And he, I didn't have a chief of uh, crime control strategies. It was just me running the meeting. To, for him to even believe, okay, yeah, we're going to continue this. And you're he chief of an department at the time, right? Yeah, I was chief of department. But, you know, it's a heavy load. Twice a week doing these meetings. Be, beyond the CompStat meeting, these guys were, were, and gals were doing it out in the street, at the precinct level, at the borough level, at the bureau level. They were running this stuff. It was a well-oiled, you know, machine at, by that point. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as they saw, you know, the meetings were continuing, they were still as hard as they ever were, you know. Now, you had a reputation, it's fair to say, of being a fire-breathing um, hard-ass. But a forward-thinking one. And that's the yeah. point. That, yeah. You know, look, Chief, Chief Animone took over for a real patent in NYPD, who he can attest, speak to more than I can, Chief Johnson, all right? The difference, of that, uh, just from my perspective, is that Chief Adamone was forward thinking. He wanted yeah. creativity. Johnson was, this is how we've always done it and you will not deviate from it. Yeah. And, and that's how you got promoted back then versus how you got promoted under Chief Adamone and Bratton. You got promoted because crime went down and you were, you were, you were addressing issues. I mean, the old word, you got promoted because your summonses were up and you passed inspections. And that, where, where are our priorities, you know? Yeah. And so, but you also character, was a cop, but he was never even a sergeant. So I mean, yeah. like, how is he running the police department? Yeah. You know, yeah, he, there, there's a rite of passage that under those, that Camelot years, you had to be a precinct commander or at least a PSA commander or a transit commander right. where you had to make those kind of decisions.
Yeah. Otherwise, you don't it's, understand it. Mm-hmm. It was a crucible. Yes. A crucible to form character and uh, mm-hmm. ingenuity, thoughtfulness. Look, when I was a precinct commander, no exaggeration, I worked 14 hours a day. I believe I looked, it. I looked at it as, like you're saying, this was a rite of passage, you know, and I, I said, I'm going to do this right. You know, I only passed this way once in my career, and I'm yeah. going to do it the right way. I was lucky that my kids were already grown enough that I didn't have to be home all the time. They were teenagers and, you know, mid to upper teenagers. Right. And so as long as I would, you know, give the money and, you know, be there for something really important like graduation, it was okay. You know, I actually drove my daughter to high school every day, to be, to be honest with you. But then after that, that was it. You know, she didn't need yeah. me like, by her side all the time. The, um, you know, I, I was watching the uh, part of the PIX11 was talking to mayoral candidates a couple of days ago. And I got to see like half of them. Um, and after Eric Adams spoke, one of the hosts of the mm-hmm. presentation, but she basically said like, well, we can't. She conflated the abuses of stop, question and frisk with simply cops stop. Oh, that Eric Adams wants police to stop people again. She said something like that as if that was clearly, we can't do that. And I said, well, I mean, I'm like, wait a second. If cops aren't supposed to stop people, then maybe we should abolish police. Like this, this is at the core of policing. Um, exactly. The pendulum has moved so far that it's not just the abuses of SQF are bad. It, it's, yeah, the idea that we now, you can say cops shouldn't stop people. I, I, well, that's that pendulum going way beyond where, yeah. reasonability. And, and again, I'm going to echo Artie. I lay that at the feet of Bloomberg and Kelly. Right. They uh-huh. dug their heels in when they had an opportunity to get out from under that exactly. lawsuit. They uh-huh. d- dug their heels in and he got double the numbers. Exactly. That, that's it's crazy. crazy. And that did Absolutely a disservice crazy. to everyone that followed that did a service to. It's, uh, they, a good cop is not happy when they do that, right? Yeah. A good cop is not happy when bad practices are being backed up. That's not backing yeah. up. That's putting cops in a vulnerable position when you're saying violate the constitution, don't worry about it. I'm going to say, I'm going to back you up. Yeah. You're not really backing me up because if anything goes wrong, then then they're going to walk away. No, I never told them to do that. You know, that, that's the, the good leader says, this is how you have to do it the right way, but you just have to be working all the time, you know, and you have to like, that's really what it comes down to. Stop and frisk is a really important tool. Terry versus Ohio laid it out. That, he prepared yeah. an armed robbery of that store, right? That's yep. what we want it for. We don't want it just to harass young minority people on their way to John Jay College in the morning. That, that's, yeah. It's meaningless then. When I was on the Zodiac Task Force, Chief, yeah. if it wasn't, we didn't abuse stop and frisk then. What we did was we were now looking for an unknown suspect that operated in the East New York cross into the Queens community, right? And so we looked at the stop and frisk as a possible clue as to who was suspicious to other police officers, but didn't really measure up to getting arrested. You know what, they don't have enough to arrest them, they let them go. That, those, those legitimate reasonable suspicion stops, that guy really could have been the criminal that we're looking for now. But when you create 700,000 250s that are meaningless, it doesn't help police officers, you know? it just. It takes away the value of it. I think they were asking for touches at the CompStat meeting. How many touches did you have? How many touches? I need more touches. You know, it was was crazy. How would have you have phrased that instead? What's the better way? Asking for touches? No, I want to know what's your plan. At every meeting it was, what's your plan to do what has to be done to reduce whatever it might have been, the shootings, the burglaries. Do you need detectives? Are you going to have a meeting with the detective squad or the narcotics squad? Or, you know, and lay it out in writing and send it up and we'll take a look at it. But, you know, you have our blessing. Go ahead and do it. Yeah, and then you also said, Chief, after you would say that, you give them the plan. Is okay, what's plan B? You always yeah. had to have plan B ready with plan A because we yeah. don't have time to make up a new plan. And yep. that really is so, that, look, when you walked into a constant room then, they put on the wall the four you know, principles of crime reduction, right? You know, so accurate and timely intelligence, rapid deployment, effective tactics, and relentless follow-up and assessment, right? I had it memorized like you know, the Bible. Yeah. 
But th- that wasn't just a slogan. It was real. Yeah, and was any real. strategy that I created for my precinct, I looked to see how it satisfied all of those criteria. And the relentless follow-up and assessment and the effective tactics were really critical. And effective tactics is what I said to you before, Peter. It's not just putting out the fire. That has to be done, right? But it's also getting results for the next few months. And then how is the, uh, my results going to build on themselves so that I continue to make gains if I'm still here a year from now? I'd actually had precinct commanders say to me, Chief, look, don't bring down too much now because how are you going to do your yeah. next year? <laughs> then you don't get it. If you have a good strategy, it builds on itself. And yeah. all those crime prevention measures are what work for next year. It's yeah. the other hey, stuff working for this year. Artie, yeah. I had chiefs telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, what are we going to do next year? Don't worry about it. It'll take care of itself. Yeah, it will if, you, if we have a real strategy. But yeah. we don't have enough cops to, to do that 24 hours a day on every street corner. We, you know, we just don't have it. So we have to be really effective in how we deploy our people. And if we, if we are effective, it will work. It will work. You know, those four principles already mentioned, Peter, uh, it's almost like writing an outline for a paper. Yeah. You know, you know paragraph one, two, three, and four. And if you fill in the blanks, which is all we wanted them to do, and make use of the people that, you know, you have working for you. Artie had, you know, really sharp people working for him. And most of the, the other precinct commanders did too. But uh, you had to ask them, you know, sit down with me and let's work this out. And by doing that, you know, you're training the next generation of these precinct commanders as well. You're allowing them to step up and uh, put their input in. I'll bet some of your best ideas, Artie, weren't always yours only. No. I tried to say that to Peter already. I would, you would, they would circulate the minutes from the ComStat meetings to everybody. So I, I would read the minutes from the Bronx meetings, from the Brooklyn South meetings, and I would get some interesting ideas that I would, you know, mold to my own personal. Yeah. One of my my burglary strategy, part of that I got from the first ComStat meeting I ever went to. That I I got the precinct the day before, so I didn't have to talk. Right. So I just right. sat there and watched what the sharp guys were doing. And what the guys who were getting beat up a little bit were doing. And I wanted to be more like the sharp guys. <laughs> and, and so I picked and choose some things from there. And I, I, I yeah, you don't make up everything yourself. Yeah. That's what ComSat's all about, really. Otherwise, you just have a personal interview. It's yeah. really to learn from each other. Chief, I want your, your opinion from this, ready? When I teach yeah. ComStat, I analogize it to an old TV show that my students have never seen, all right? That maybe you saw an episode of. And that's Kung Fu. All right. You ever see the original Kung Fu series? So in Kung Fu, Kwai Chang King gets adopted by a Shaolin temple when he's about, I don't know, seven, eight years old or something. Right. And you see him in the opening episode, the opening montage. Yeah. uh, Him growing up, learning all the different arts, the tiger claw, crouching, all that stuff. And finally, when he's ready to graduate from the temple, he stands in front of a target. And the priests that have been teaching him for the last dozen years pick up spears and they start throwing at him, right? But because he's well-trained, he just flicks the spears away and he right. graduates and becomes a priest. Comstat is like that. If you come to the meeting prepared, you deflect all those sharp questions. Not deflect, you, you can answer them. Handle them, you can right? handle them. But if you are not prepared, yeah. you like those spears they hit yeah. and you die, you know, yeah. but you don't physically die, your career dies, you know, it's like, <laughs> and so if you, if you want to do well, then you're going to do your homework and you're going to come prepared, you know. More, more people were rewarded and had better careers as a result of CompStat than people who lost their commands and Absolutely. had terrible careers. Yeah, and it's the people that won't, um, that really didn't understand, and I don't know how you could not understand it. It's right there. And don't yeah. ever lie at Comstat. Don't ever <laughs> lie because you got sharp guys asking the questions. I'm not going to name names again, but this one guy, it was about GLAs, all right? And Chief, you asked, I think you asked the question, um, why are GLAs so up in your command and you have uh, so few collars? 
And the precinct commander answered, well, my, my guys make arrests for GLA, but the DA knocks them down at ECAB to less than the GLA. Now, anybody who makes any collars for a living, no, that, that doesn't mean that's all bullshit because the, the charge in the arrest report is what goes to Comstat, not the charge from the ECAB. <laughs> but I'm not gonna say anything because I don't wanna give up the precinct commander. But I saw Ma Maple, like Chief Animo, were both arrest, were cops. And so finally, yeah. Maple, like a light bulb goes on his head. So wait a second, someone from the DA's office here? I said, that's not the answer, you know? Yeah. You can't lie. You can't get by with, you know, you can't. Yeah, bullshit. Yeah. You no, know, you can't. So what, what's gone wrong as of late? How much can police, how, how can we get back to effective crime prevention or, or prevention or is it the politics right now prohibit Well, that? Peter, you know, I, I, I gave you a couple of ideas on that. Uh, and the violence wrote, reduction uh, yes. website, yes. We're over-specialized right now. And this counterterrorism division and the intelligence division, you know, wore Ray Kelly's gems. You know, they were great ideas. I don't think we have the luxury. We can afford that luxury anymore. You need boots on the ground. You need probably your most experienced cops in this city right now are in those details. They have to get out, they gotta be on the street, they gotta be walking beats, beats that mean something, beats where people see you, transportation centers, shopping centers, shopping areas. Uh, people have gotta to start to see the cops. Now, going backwards, you know, we in, in 94, you had a lot of crime, but you had cops that were willing to step up all they needed was that, you know, leadership from the top. Now, you know, you're kind of reversed. They're there, they're ready to work, but uh, no one's asking them, you know, to go out and do anything. The unions are certainly telling them to, you know, cover their ass. And you have a, uh, a political leadership that's not looking for this now. But this is what has to be done. You know, they got to get uniforms, got to get them out on the street. And if nothing else, there'll be a perception, certainly, as they walk the street, as they talk to shop owners and store owners and pedestrians, there'll be that perception that, hey, things aren't so bad. What's, what's the role of the union in this? I, I, if... Well, you know, they, they, they speak to, for the cops and they speak to the cops. Do cops listen to that, them? I guess that's, that's what I'm saying. Well, I think we have bad leadership. It's the same thing that the chiefs are, uh, is talking to about leadership in the department. Leadership in the union is, is a similar issue. You, look, you, 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 we don't, they're not appointed, of course. So it's not like we can remove them. That it's right. the union to remove them, but you know, the membership to remove them. But I think that the chief was actually absolutely accurate when he was saying that the unions are telling cops, I think, not to do work for, because of the backlash that we yeah. had over stop and frisk. But, but also there's so the, let's not forget the diaphragm part of the chokehold ban. That's a big deal. Of to course, be yeah. First that's, of all, first yeah. of all the, understand is we haven't allowed chokeholds in New York City since the 1970s, right? And it was already we, illegal in the state, by the way, which I didn't know until yeah. recently. When we, huh. when we, when Arthur Miller was killed in Brooklyn back in the 70s, they banned the chokehold. It was never authorized when I was in, in the police department, ever, all right? With that said, while we, while we define as a chokehold today is a little different than an absolute chokehold. And so you get somebody in a headlock to try and bring them down to the ground, they're calling that a chokehold. Yeah, that's, that's not a chokehold. A chokehold is when you're getting your forearm around the guy's neck and you're crossing off his, you know, you have to get the guy to the ground. It's, it's, we live in a real world. People don't want to get arrested. Right? And in, in, the, in the case of the unions now telling their, their people, you know, with this diaphragm law, that's that's very good advice that they're telling them because the area that they're discussing that they're uh, forbidding you to touch uh, is is you know it's very good it can be very very odd unless you have a compliant suspect. Let me just take a second to explain. So, um, last June, I think, or July, um, the city New York City Council passed a chokehold ban, which again was already redundant because chokeholds were already criminalized by New York State law, but the New York City version banned pressure on the diaphragm. Uh, through sitting, kneeling, or standing um, in the course of an arrest. Now, to throw that diaphragm part in there, you basically can't arrest a resisting suspect um, without a very good chance of putting pressure on the diaphragm. 
Um, and they say, oh, we're, well, we're not going to prosecute it. I, I, I don't know if I trust that. No, exactly. That's what, right. That's what unions are fighting against. Yeah. The, look, it, we already knew back in the 90s, all right, we had a, a number of people die from positional asphyxia after they had been arrested and struggled with police officers and they were put face down in the back of a radio car and they would die with no cop on them just because they had already spent all their energy and they couldn't inflate their own diaphragm. So a study was done back then. Remember, Mike Julian was the chief of personnel back then, right? Right. And, Mike, and we came out with orders then saying, once you get the handcuffs on the guy, you must put him in a position to promote free breathing. That was yeah. the rule. We're going back 27, 26, whatever, years ago. All right. Yep. So that we knew that problem back then. What, what Chauvin did was never authorized in New York, ever. And it was probably never, well, I won't say probably not authorized there because they had some stupid rule uh, uh, in, in Minneapolis that didn't make any sense. But we understood 26 years ago that we got to get this guy in a position to promote free breathing. But you still have to get him first. You still have to put handcuffs on him. So I have to feel comfortable enough that I can get on my guy to get the handcuffs on him and then get off my guy and put him on his side. That's how cops are always taught to, to act, right? The problem with Eric Garner, and I'm interested to hear your position on this, G, was that once they had him down, Officer Pantaleo should not have had him in a headlock anymore. He was down, they had him on his side. They were, you know, to me, that's, that's, he should have you know, lessened the pressure. He was you know, pressuring his head to the ground and it was hard to justify that action. But so on, on that specific case, I, I had less of a, uh, an issue with Pantaleo's actions than I did with the two sergeants who were there on the scene. I'm 100% in agreeing with you about the sergeants. I blame them because they didn't take charge. Thank they, you. They didn't call for help. They didn't call for the ambulance. They didn't give any direction to any of the cops there. They didn't even use the taser. Terrible. They didn't yeah. Play it's terrible. Taser. Yeah. It's terrible. I, I, the, the, the thing never should have gotten to the Pantaleo point. I agree 100% right. with you. I, that's how I say it. To, the, the person to blame the most was the sergeant. You know what? Yeah. What's happened in Chicago recently with their foot? Have you seen their new foot pursuit policy? I heard about it. Uh, so, so in other words, if you have the reasonable grounds to uh, arrest someone, you can uh, have a foot chase. Otherwise, it's it's worse than that. It's it's a ban. Um, technically, yeah. it's not, but it's written in much the same way as a yeah. vehicle pursuit policy, which is um, it explicitly says you can never get in trouble for not pursuing at the officer or supervisory level. And um, if you do pursue, um, it's on. I mean, like, it's I, on you. I, I, can, I can read cop. Um, it's a foot, it's a ban. It's, it's a de facto yeah. ban of foot not, pursuits. How can you ban foot pursuits? Nobody wants to get arrested. And look, the, the there was, the Chief could speak better to this than I can, but in, in prior generations from me, there was an, an inappropriate punishment for running away from police officers. All right. I know that. Because I've, I've, I've heard of it, I've heard of it. But my approach was different. My approach was, hey, they had, look, I, I was young, athletic back then. My approach was, their job is to commit crime and get away. My job is to catch them. Once I catch them, it's all over. I don't, I, I don't hold a grudge about that. I understand yeah. they want to get away. All right. I only take it personal if you attack me. Then I'm going to take it personal. But if you're just trying to get away from me, that's my job to get you. All right. Yeah. And so there's no one get you. I'll get you on the ground, handcuff you. It's all over. Look, I, I am I am as liberal a person as you can get in the police department. I really am, but there's, there's a point. Oh, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> I know. I, I, I have a reputation for this. Trust me. All right. But with that <laughs> so said, <did> I. <laughs> but, but with that said, Peter, I had more calls than anybody in my precinct, other than the people who had the cross conditions call. All right. And but were you arresting the right people? Yes, and I was in the anti crime team, locking up robbers yeah. and burglars, and I was in narcotics. All right, and I was in the detective bureau. So the point is, you could be a liberal guy and be and make lots of arrests. And be a good cop. Yeah, yeah. you know, you just don't have to. Well, you can't be as, you can't be, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, from. Uh, uh, Sipowitz. Yeah, I hated that show for that reason. Yeah, I Sipowitz. can't watch a show that glorifies a bad cop. And let, uh, let me try and just for the sake of playing devil's advocate here. So, 
I was like, okay, you even use the term bad guys. Um, now, some many people today might say that's the problem is you see the world divided between good guys and bad guys, where in fact, um, well, you know, I mean, you can imagine sort of the argument I'm, I'm, I'm presenting here. Um, what do you say to that? Even bad guys are human beings. That's what I'm going to say to you. But what happens is this. Uh, we used to say this at CompStat, and I, I, even when I was a narcotics borough commander, I agreed with it, all right? About 80% of your street crime, right, is drug related in some way, shape, or form. You know, it's you got the drug dealers and you got the drug users who have to commit crime to buy their drugs. There's other crime out there, but a large percentage of your street crime, street crime, street crime are people that need money for drugs. And when you really need money for drugs, you've lost a lot of your human qualities. You are still a human being, and we have to treat you that way. But what we can't expect is you to act that way, all right? So you have a, some sense of morals that you won't cross a line, all right? These people will cross any line and you have to understand that. They're, 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 they're in survival mode all the time. So, so Peter, the, the other part of that uh, question you asked is, you know, if we have cops who are working, you know, steady tours in steady precincts on steady beats, you know, where they get to know the community, which is what we hope, right? That they act on their information, their experience, and they'll know, gee, it's, you know, after midnight, we got a rash of commercial burglaries, and here's these two guys walk. These could be, quote, bad guys. I'm going to stop and engage them in conversation. Isn't that what it's, you know, so you're saying, but I, but to be clear, and this is kind of what I was asking, uh, yeah. and I didn't actually know how you were going to answer it. You're saying bad guy meaning criminal. So I'm going to engage yeah. in not morally, yeah. theologically. No, no, criminals <laughs> <laughs> about to commit or have, has committed. <laughs> but, but again, what I said is true. When we're talking about yeah. people who are, have some desperation involved here. I feel it needs to be said, like it's always been known in the police world, um, and this, you know, academically, it even goes back to Egon Bittner. I'm talking about police defined by the use of force. But I feel there's, for sort of PR reasons, that's often avoided. Um, it's all about voluntary compliance and not going hands on. And I think at some point, police departments need to make a stronger case that, yes, we use force. Um, we're going to do it legally and constitutionally and as little as we, ha we have to but not back away from that fact. And yeah, sometimes it looks ugly. Right. Yeah. And we don't have to use force. It's a fact of life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we don't have to use force in every incident, but any incident could end up resulting in the use of force. And that's what you have to look. I, because I, that's why cops are there. You have to reserve the right to any and all police officers to use force if and when they feel it's appropriate. Right. And then to be judged you know, by the rules of the department or the rules of the state or the city as to whether or not that use was justified. But you can't have them not engage. You can't have them not pursue. You can't have them not use force because something may or may not happen. So we do need leadership. Police yeah. leadership throughout the country has got to speak up on this. The pendulum has gone way, way too far. We've only seen one or two chiefs, I think, that you know, had the backbone to stop and, and say, you know, you're wrong with this craziness. We're, we're all uh, trained to respect human life, right? We know that it's an awesome responsibility using the firearm or using deadly force in any manner. Uh, you know, this sh should not surprise us, certainly. It shouldn't be a surprise to the public if our message is getting out there. Hey, cops are the last people who want to hurt somebody or kill somebody. Do you remember, Chief, that hostage barricaded situation in the bar on Rockaway Boulevard in front of uh, Aqueduct Racetrack? And <laughs> you know that? that that was the, uh, wait a minute, no, the starting gate, the starting line, finish line, the name of the bar. Do you think cops would do a better job as dis uh, if we had, if we de-civilianized dispatch and had police officers doing that? At any I don't think that's necessary. I think this dispatchers uh, really care about what they're doing. And I think the good cops actually love their dispatchers. Oh yeah, uh, but that's sort of yeah. why I mentioned it. I, I didn't. I, I don't mean that as a slight against dispatchers. Yeah. Other than I think they're not paid enough. Like we have this super important job, and it's kind of the you know it's it's pretty low down on the on the totem pole. Yeah. yeah. Did you hear this? This was a suggestion actually. All right. 
for allowing cops to retire and collect their pension and then come back and work as dispatchers. That's a great like, idea. Right, get a salary, get right another idea. pension. Yeah. But allow them, like it's a moon, like people retire and they, they do other things. Yeah. We can take advantage of their experience in that way. Allow them to yeah. have their pension. They're not really suited to do street work anymore, but we yeah. still love the department and love you know, doing something. That would so be- you, 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 You'd have to, you're gonna be running up against the uh, dispatchers union, you know. With, they with, could join uh, the union. Make it join yeah. the union. We don't have to, no, don't fire any dispatchers. Yeah, all like right. Let join the dispatchers union. Yeah. You know, uh, I think that would probably be a good idea. Hey, listen, fellas, it's been a slice of heaven, but I'm going to have to run. I think we all should. We've been at it a while. Hey, Chief, all it was right. really good seeing you again. <laughs> Same here, Roddy. Thanks for listening. This has been Quality Policing. More can be found at qualitypolicing.com, including... Uh, Louis Anamone's contribution to my violence reduction project. Uh, His essay and many other essays are there online, as are other episodes of this podcast. I was here today with Louis Anamone and Arthur Storch. I'd like to thank them for their time, and thank you for listening. (laughs) 